Hallelujah. Is everybody excited for one more service? Amen. Come on, hands up with me. In hope we rise, we speak your name, we lift our eyes, tune our hearts into your beat, where we are, there you be, with fire in our eyes, a light, a light, your love untamed, is blazing now, the streets we will go, for every bright, your glory is breaking. Normally, our messages are a part of a series, but today's message is just a standalone. And what I want to talk to you about today is I want to talk to you about your happiness immune system. I want to talk to you about your happiness immune system. I think that more people would take advantage of their happiness immune system if they knew that they had it because it gives you the ability to, to find happiness in things that you wouldn't think you would otherwise. So go with me to God's Word. We're going to start off in the book of Philippians. I'm going to read some passages or some scripture verses here that you probably have heard before. 
Uh, Philippians is in the New Testament. For those of you who aren't familiar with the Bible as well, the rest of us who grew up in vacation Bible school where we had to memorize them, it's toward the end of the New Testament. It's right before Colossians. If you see Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, those are the Gospels. Just go past those a little bit further, and you'll find the book of Philippians. It's a letter written by a guy named Paul uh, to a church, a group of people who are newly followers of Jesus in the city of Philippi. I'm going to read to you verses 11 through 13. He says this to them. Actually, I'm going to back it up to verse 10. I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last you have revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned for me, but had no opportunity to show it. Not that I am referring to being in need, for I have learned to be content in whatever I have. I know what it is to have little, and I know what it is to have plenty. In any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being well-fed and of going hungry, of having plenty and of being in need. And then here's Tim Debo. I can do all things <laughs> through him who strengthens me. You know, people want happiness, don't we? We want happiness. The problem is we underestimate our ability to make it. We underestimate our ability to, to make happiness, like to synthetically make happiness. Now, I'm not the one that came up with this. It's, credit goes to a Harvard professor, Dan Gilbert, who through his research suggests that we as human beings have a special talent to be able to find a way to be happy with what happens in our life. He says that we have this thing called a psychological immune system. I'm calling it a happiness immune system. He calls it a psychological immune system that allows us to restructure how we see something so that we can experience it more joyfully the next time we think about it. So I, I was listening to this TED Talk that he had done that has gone viral and, and thinking about it because he's telling us that our brain has this ability to make happiness. And he says that this immune system that we all have, it's triggered by unchangeability, which is a situation where there is no expectation of change. It's when you've made a choice, you're locked in, and you can't go back. And he says that when you're in that kind of situation, your body kicks into this immune system, which enables you to find a way to be happy with what just has happened. You ever thought about this before? I had never thought of this concept before uh, previous to watching this. And really, honestly, the only reason why I was watching it is because I love using stuff from culture and, and finding where God exists in it. And so as I'm listening to this, I'm realizing that this sounds really good, but there's one difficulty that almost all of us have. And the difficulty that we have is that we overestimate, we overvalue our freedom to choose and change our mind. We think that keeping our options open actually gives us a better shot at finding happiness. So, for example, if we make a choice and the consequences or the outcomes of that choice cramps on our satisfaction, our go-to is to change our mind so that we can change the outcome. It happens all the time. Like, people overestimate how they think they will feel when they make a decision. We mispredict how we will feel. Oftentimes, we mispredict how we will feel if we move from one house to another. We mispredict how we will feel if we go from one position at work to a different position at work. We mispredict how we feel if we change schools or try out for a different team or graduate from high school. Remember those days? I thought, man, the best day of my life is going to be graduating from high school. And then you graduate high school and it's like, <laughs> it just feels the same as every other day. We mispredict how we think we're going to feel about something. And when it doesn't feel good, we go to that place of, I got to change it so that I can change the outcome because it'll have to make me feel better than I feel right now because I don't feel as good as I thought that I would. Well, rather than make sense of it for you, I thought, why not let you see this TED Talk, a part of it, where he talks about an experiment uh, that he did at his school at Harvard University where he brought some students in 
and invited them to do something to, to see how they would respond. So check out this a couple minutes video of him talking about what he did. The psychological immune system works best when we are totally stuck, when we are trapped. This is, this is the difference between dating and marriage, right? I mean, you go out on a date with a guy and he picks his nose, you don't go out on another date. You're married to a guy and he picks his nose, yeah, he has a heart of gold, don't touch the fruitcake, right? You find a way to be happy with what's happened. Now, what I want to show you is that people don't know this about themselves, and not knowing this can work to our supreme disadvantage. Here's an experiment we did at Harvard. We created a photography course, a black and white photography course, and we allowed students to come in and learn how to use a darkroom. So we gave them cameras, they went around campus, they took 12 pictures of their favorite professors in their dorm room and their, you know, their dog and all the other things they wanted to have Harvard memories of. They bring us the camera, we make up a contact sheet, they figure out which are the two best pictures, and we now spend six hours teaching them about dark rooms, and they blow two of them up, and they have two gorgeous eight by 10 glossies of meaningful things to them, and we say, which one would you like to give up? They say, I have to give one up? Oh, yes, we need one as evidence of the class project. So you have to give me one, you have to make a choice, you get to keep one, and I get to keep one. Now, there are two conditions in this experiment. In one case, the students are told, but you know, if you want to change your mind, I'll always have the other one here. And in the next four days before I actually mail it to headquarters, I'll be glad to, yeah, headquarters. I'll be glad to swap it out with you. In fact, I'll come to your dorm room and give, just give me an email, better yet, I'll check with you. You ever want to change your mind? It's totally returnable. The other half of the students are told exactly the opposite. Make your choice, and by the way, the mail is going out, gosh, in two minutes to England, your picture will be winging its way over the Atlantic, you will never see it again. Now, <laughs> half of the students in each of these conditions are asked to make predictions about how much they're going to come to like the picture that they keep and the picture they leave behind. Other students are just sent back to their little dorm rooms, and they are measured over the next uh, six to, uh, three to six days on their liking and satisfaction with the pictures. Look at what we find. First of all, here's what students think is going to happen. They think they're gonna maybe come to like the picture they chose a little more than the one they left behind, but these are not statistically significant differences. It really, it's a very small increase and it doesn't much matter whether they were in the reversible or irreversible condition. Wrong go bad simulators, because here's what's really happening, both right before the swap and five days later, people who are stuck with that picture, who have no choice, who can never change their mind, like it a lot. And people who are deliberating, should I return it? Have I gotten the right one? Maybe this isn't the good one. Maybe I left the good one, have killed themselves. They don't like their picture, and in fact, even after the opportunity to swap has expired, they still don't like their picture. Why? Because the irreversible condition is not conducive to the synthesis of happiness. So here's the final piece of this experiment. We bring in a whole new group of naive Harvard students and we say, you know, we're doing a photography course and we can do it one of two ways. We could do it so that when you take the two pictures, you'd have four days to change your mind, or we're doing another course where you take the two pictures and you make up your mind right away and you can never change it, which course would you like to be in? Duh! 66% of the students, two thirds, prefer to be in the course where they have the opportunity to change their mind. Hello, 66% of the students choose to be in the course in which they will ultimately be deeply dissatisfied with the picture. <laughs> because they do not know the conditions under which synthetic happiness grows. That's <laughs> crazy, isn't it? He talks about how our economy thrives on giving you multiple choices. I immediately went to the grocery store and to the cereal aisle. Anybody else? I mean, go down the cereal aisle. It is overwhelming. It's overwhelming. Like, why in the world would we have to have so many different kinds of cereal? And then you go to your local market, whether it's Publix or Walmart, or uh, Winn-Dixie, and they all have their own version of the brand name versions. And they, and they have all these versions because they want you to come and try this cereal and think, well, what if I like that one better? And then you come back and you try this cereal and you think, well, that one tastes good, but what if I like that one better? And just keep bringing you back and bringing you back and bringing you back. Like, that's the way our economy thrives, is by giving you multiple choices 
making you believe that there's a better one out there. You ever go to a restaurant with someone and they always choose the same thing? You get annoyed by it, don't you? You're like, why don't you try something else? <laughs> There's all this stuff on the menu. Why do you try something else? And the person who always eats the same thing always feels the same way. Satisfied. <laughs> While you sit there and you look at your menu and you're thinking to yourself, well, that looks good. But man, that looks good too. And I'm not sure about that one. And I don't know which one to get. And then whatever you get, you don't like it because you regret that you didn't get the other thing. You all, some of you fit in these categories. That's who you are. Now, I'm not saying, and neither is Dan saying, that you shouldn't have a choice. Because some choices lead to a better future. We all have choices to make. But I think if we're honest, I don't think our struggle is with limiting our choices as human beings. I think our struggle is with limiting our God-given ability to find happiness in the choices that we've made. I didn't call Dan and ask his permission to do this. So if he watches this on YouTube, then I have no idea how he found it. <laughs> I did not ask his permission for this. I don't know how he believes. But I believe that what he's talking about is a part of God's design in us. And so that's why I wanted to take what he said and help make sense of it with you. Because I believe that the Apostle Paul gives us an excellent ex ex example of how this plays out in our life in his letter to the Philippians. An excellent example. Paul is writing from prison to a group of Jesus followers who have been faithful to provide for his needs. And he tells us in his letter, I want nothing more than for those of you who have become followers of Jesus to live daily with greater godly wisdom. That's all he wants is for them to remain followers of Jesus and to bring some more followers of Jesus into this life, for them to be transformed every day and, and grow in maturity of those who reflect Jesus. That's what he wants for them. And so that's why he writes the letter, is because he wants their faith to grow and to continue. In chapter 3, verse 1, he gives them this imperative. Rejoice in the Lord, he says. An imperative to rejoice. He's telling them, I want you to be glad in God. I want you to be happy in your connection to Christ. He's telling them, be happy. Like, rejoice in God. But then immediately after that, he does something a little bit strange. What he does is he begins to warn them to steer clear of this description of these people whose confidence is found in their resume the things that they've done in their lives and their abilities and the things that they can accomplish. And then if you know Paul, he's always confronting. I believe I'm more like the Paul type, who I say something and you look at me like, Coy, did you just say that? <laughs> like, he's not afraid to confront. And so Paul confronts everyone. He says, listen, if anybody has impressive credentials, it's me. And he says, he's it's me. Because when it comes to God's people, the Israelites, I am pure pedigree. <laughs> and when it comes to the law, if you know Paul's story, he says, I'm devout. When it comes to the purity of my religion, I am a fiery defender. We know what he did to the people who were followers of Jesus. He says, when it comes to listening to and following the words of God, I am meticulous. However, the gains that I have had and the gains that I could have because of those things in who I am, my resume, I have thrown them out as options because I have chose to own only one. In verse 8, he says, I regard everything as Loss, everything. God, pay attention to that word. He says, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord. And then in verse 8, he says, it's because of him. It's for Jesus' sake that I have suffered the loss of everything. And I consider it, or I regard it now, rubbish. 
Now, that may not make any sense to any of you because you're looking at me like you don't understand what I'm saying. Like, take everything that you have, all your securities, all of your wealth, if you have any. I don't, but I'd love to have some of yours. <laughs> take the things that you love about your life, your boat, your house, your car, your security. Like, knowing that you're going to have a future, thinking that you, you have people who care about you and love you and are around you and don't want to throw you in prison. Take all those things away from you. And Paul says, I, I consider those as rubbish. I don't even care about those things. So that I can gain Christ. So that I can gain Christ. Paul says, I believe what Paul is saying. And the example that we see is that Paul chose one option and he owns it. And he finds happiness no matter the outcome. If you know Paul's story, you know what I'm talking about. He owns this option that he's been given, and he finds the way to be happy with whatever happens. Jump down to verse 12, and Paul says, listen to this. I press on to make it my own. And then in verse 13, forgetting what lies behind and straining for what lies ahead. In verse 12, he says, I press on to make it my own, forgetting what lies behind and straining for what lies ahead. If there's anybody in the Bible that I know of who's an example of choosing an option and owning it, who's willing to give up his freedom to make another choice to create a different outcome, I believe it's Paul. Like he chose one option and he owns it. And I want you to see something. I want you to see how this influences one of the most popular verses in the Bible. In verse 11 in the book of Philippians chapter 4, Paul writes to the people that I have learned to be content with whatever I have. Which I interpret as I don't need any other options. In verse 12, he says, I know what it is to have little, and I know what it is to have plenty in any and all circumstances. Notice that he's willing to own this option that he has. I have learned the secret of being well-fed and of going hungry, of having plenty, and of being in need. And then here it is, the verse that we all know. I can do all things. I can own any option that God gives me through God who strengthens me. Do you see it? <laughs> Paul says, I don't need a different option to create a different outcome. This is a man speaking from prison. Most of us in this room, we're not willing to choose our faith in order to send us to prison. I, I don't believe anybody in this room, maybe one or two of us, probably excluding me, who if somebody walked into this room and they were saying, okay, everybody in this room, if you're a follower of Jesus, stand up. But if you stand up, you're going to jail. And on the way, we're going to stop, we're going to flog you. <laughs> and when you get to jail, you have no contact with your family. Cell phone out. You all can't survive without your cell phone for two minutes. I mean, nobody in this room is like, yeah, I'm going to sign up for this option, the option that leads me to prison, the, the option that leads me to persecution, the, the option that leads me to losing my family, the option that leads me to losing my friends, the option that leads me to looking weird at work, the option that leads me to a place where I don't fit in. Nobody's going to choose that option. And if we choose that option and we get that result, we want to choose a different one. But Paul says, I'll choose that option. Because I have learned the secret of being content in all things. I have learned, I have learned that happiness is found in Jesus. In any and all circumstances. Wouldn't you love to be happy in any and all circumstances? I believe that Paul is saying, I can do all things with no expectation of change. I can do all things without worrying about regret. I can do all things with outcomes that I cannot control because I have learned the secret to happiness is found in God's strength given to me in any and all circumstances. And then it comes to speak to us. And the challenge that's given to us 
is that we need to change our minds about our freedom to change our minds. And I think when we do, it will influence so many options that we think we need to make. And for some of you, it will influence how you date. <laughs> it will influence how you date. Young people in the room, I see some of you out there, but you don't have to be young to date. <laughs> As I was watching this, this TED Talk and I was putting this message together and I was thinking about well, what is God saying to us and how, how does this relate to what Paul is saying about his life and, and, and where it's, it's led him and, and somebody who's been able to choose an option that's hard and own it and not have to think I need to go back to this place and have this better option. I was thinking about dating. And in the Christian world, we have this debate right now with our people and the debate is about should I move in with somebody before I get married? And the debate is based on a rule. And I will say, forget about the rule right now. Forget about the rule of whether it's right or wrong to move in with someone before you get married. And I'm not trying to call anybody out. I just want you to think about this for a moment. How this plays into our culture that we live in today. Because what's happening most of the time is we are moving in together before we get married. But why are we doing it? To keep our options open. We're not willing to make that commitment to say, you know what, I'll choose this option and I'll own it. We want to choose that option without owning it. We want to bring you and say, you know what, come into my life right now, but I want to keep my options open. So if you move in with me and we don't get married, then I can kick you out and I don't have to pay all those bills I would have to do if I got married to you. And I think it's messing with us as human beings. I think that's a, that's a big reason why we as a culture are struggling to even get to the place where we value marriage anymore. Because we actually think that moving in with someone helps us decide whether we'll be happy or not. But in reality, I think what it's doing <laughs> is putting us in a position where we're not able to find happiness. Because whenever it doesn't satisfy us, we know we have an option, so we choose a different one. And 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 then when we finally choose the one, and we get into marriage, then we're used to choosing a different one, and we don't know what to do, and so we get divorced. And I don't, trust me, I'm not saying that because I am judgmental. Brooklyn could tell you I, I'm not a, a judgmental person. I'm just not. But do you see it? <laughs> when you choose it and, and you own it, Brooklyn and I got married at 19 years old. She had to choose it and own it, or she wouldn't be married to me anymore today. I, I wish I was perfect. That's what my family called me growing up, Mr. Perfect. But she'll tell you that I'm not Mr. Perfect. And because we made that decision in that day at 19 years old where we couldn't go through all those options, I think God saved me from having my wife not be someone who would just want to throw me out for someone else. But for some of you, when you can change your mind about your freedom to change your mind, it will also influence how you choose a major. I've, I've done young adult ministry at different churches, and, and there's a common thread that I've been seeing through uh, our, our high school graduates going into college, and I think it's confirmed if you go to talk to any college around, is that most students are taking longer to graduate from college than it's actually required. It's the strangest thing. And as parents, I don't think we love that. <laughs> because it costs us more money. And it's, the colleges love it. They want you to, to go to school for a four-year degree and, and get out six. That's what they want. But the reason why people are going to college that it should only take four years and getting out in six is because they can't decide what major they want to choose. They can't figure it out. And they go to college and think, man, I don't know what to do. There's, and they give you this catalog and you start thinking, you say, what thing would make me happy? Like, what job would make me happy? I don't know. I, I'll choose communications <laughs> or business. Or I'll just be undecided right now. I, I think the average person that goes to college changes their major at least two or three times. And I think <laughs> as you see these students graduate, high school and college, and then they have this degree in their hand, and they're coming back, and their mom and their dad, and they're saying, Mom and Dad, I need to move back into your house because I don't like this anymore. I don't want to be a teacher anymore. They've never gotten themselves to a place where they could say, I own this choice. And so they keep chasing for that happiness. 
Some of you in this room, it will influence how you work. It will influence how you work because you go to work and you don't like the work that you do. But it's the job that you chose. And so you go to work every day thinking, I wish I had another job. I don't like the people I work with. I don't like the work that I do. I don't like where it's located. I don't like the drive. I don't like anything about it. I just wish I had another job. And, you're, and you might be the person who's changed jobs 10 times in the last three years because you can't find a job that you like. And my dad was a school bus driver most of my childhood. And this is one thing I think I respect the most about my dad. I, I wish he was something other than a school bus driver uh, because it would have been cool to see what my dad could have done with the dreams that he had for himself. But we lived in a small town which you don't move away from when you're a small-town Ohio boy. You, you don't go somewhere else. You stay where your family are. And, and the job that he could get was driving a school bus driver that would provide some security for my family. And my dad could have done that every single day for 25 years and thought to himself, this is stupid. I hate it. Why am I here? I want to do something else. And he would never have been happy. But my dad was the kind of school bus driver who said, there has to be a way to own this job that I've chosen for myself. And he found a way. Every time those kids would get on his school bus the first day of school every single year, he would say, good morning, what is your name? And they would tell him their name. And the next person got on the bus, he said, good morning, what is your name? And they would tell them their name. And then that night when he took them back home from school, he would say, what is your name? What is your name? What is your name? And he would do that until he could memorize every single one of their names. For 25 years, my dad has a bank of names in his head because of the kids who got on his bus. And I don't go back to my hometown very often, but when I go back to my hometown, I'll be walking around the streets with my dad, and somebody will say, Hey, Delbert! That's my dad's name, by the way. If you don't laugh, you can. Hey, Delbert! And my dad will be like, Hey, how are you doing? I haven't seen you for a while. And my dad will stop and talk to him, and then we'll walk away. And my dad will say, well, do you remember this person? I'm like, Dad, come on, man. It's been so long since I've lived in Logan. How am I going to remember their name? And he's like, oh, that's right. Uh, he was on my bus. He comes and tells me all the time, you were like a dad to me. And that's owning something. That's finding happiness in what you do. But we as a culture, we want to chase after something else. And so if you were to own one option, and find a way to be happy in it, it would change how you work. It would also influence some of you in this room how you get involved at school. Without owning an option, I'm convinced it's difficult to find satisfaction in the outcome because this constant drive to chase after something that's better leads all of us to sacrifice things of real value. But when you can choose an option and own it, you are able to find happiness with whatever happens in any and all circumstances because God leads you to gain things of real value such as enduring relationships, godly wisdom, spiritual maturity, and a deep, long, lasting impact in our world. I think about... Uh, my trip to Ohio a couple weeks ago, and we went to see the caves. Old Man's Cave is where we went. That's my hometown, like spot that everybody knows about, the Hocking Hills. And I didn't even know what created the Hocking Hills. I, I guess I skipped that part in school history when I was growing up. <laughs> and so we were there, and we took our kids, and we would take them to these spots where these caves had been formed, and there's one cave on the face the side of it looks like a face of an old man. And uh, we set out to just go to a couple spots, and we ended up walking three miles one way. And half of the group could not walk the three miles back. <laughs> so the, the ones in the group who have been running like fools training for a marathon were said, well, well, we'll run back and get the cars and come back and get you. So we ran three more miles to get the cars and come back. But along the way, we would stop and we'd read the signs about Old Man's Cave and Rose Lake and all the places I used to visit when I was a kid and I didn't even realize what happened. It was water that created the caves. Water. Water. Dropping onto this ground makes no impact if I take the same drip of water and move it over here and move it over here and move it over here. 
But over time, water that drips in the same spot can drill a hole through pretty much anything because it owns it. And I really feel like God was giving me this word to tell some of you tonight, stop chasing after the thing that you think is better, but to own the option, the person, the place, the career, the school, the team, the friend, the colleague, the boss, the city, the town, the neighborhood, the house, the car, the resources, the justice issue, the opportunity, like own it and let God show you the happiness that <laughs> he created you to find in it no matter what happens. Are you ready for that kind of happiness? Yeah, I think about us as a church, three years old, and we've talked about where do we want to be as a church just in terms of location. And when we first started, we had no clue. And when Andy Baker, my friend, said, you can come at our place, we were like, yes, we're going to do that. It was just a matter of, let's just go do it. And we did it. And then we move into here. And we like it here. It's a pretty good place. But then we, we're wondering now, can we stay here? Is this a place where we can stay? Is it, is it good stewardship? Is it something we can afford? And in our brains, we start thinking about, okay, well, what if we moved? What if we changed? And, and we start, will, will something be better? Will we be more happy? I remember the conversation we had when we were at the vineyard and as our core team was together trying to talk about what are we going to be. And I remember some of the conversations. If we just had a sign, more people would show up. <laughs> that never happens. Pastors in the room, just because you have a sign, people don't show up. But I think a little bit in our brain, we think if we just had that, then we would have the happiness that we want. And God says, it doesn't matter where you are. If you are with me, I'll give you the strength and enable you to find happiness in whatever you're doing. School bus driver, volleyball player, stay-at-home mom, retired senior, former pastor, student who hates going to school. You can find happiness because that's the way God created you. So stand with me. What I want to do is I want to pray for all of you that you would find that inner strength that God gives you to own the option that you know God is calling you to take. And some of you, you already, you're already in the option. Like you've already, you've already made the choice and God is saying, own it. Well, we have friends here who, who, who just moved from the west coast of the U.S. They have to own it. Or there'll always be jonesing for the better weather out west. <laughs> it doesn't get hot and wet like it is here. Although I prefer that over the cold, dry. But some of you need to own something in your life right now. You need to own your marriage and the person who's in it. You need to own your job and realize the impact that you can have doing that job well the way you're doing it right now. Some of you as students, you need to own your school. Like, this is my school. Like, this is my school. I don't care what anybody else says about it. Like, this is mine. Like, this is where I go. And I will own every second that I'm here. And I will make it the best school it could possibly be because I was here and I was a part of it. You will find happiness in doing that. I guarantee you, students. If you're the kind of people who go to the classroom and say, I'm going to own what the teacher teaches me. I'm going to own that. You won't go to class and put your head down and be like, this is horrible. I want to go home. Mom, dad, why can't you homeschool me? I just believe that's a word for us tonight is God saying, I can do all things in any and all circumstances through God who gives me strength. Let God give you strength rather than choose it on your own. Can I pray for you, some of you, who want that? Bow your heads. If you're here tonight and you crave the ability to rejoice, you're hungry for that joy and happiness of life, but it's something that seems to be passing through your hands, something you can never grasp. Constant chase after something that's better, but never found. 
And tonight you want to own the life and the option that God has given you. Will you raise your hand and say, pray for me? That's good. That's good. That's good. Everybody else in the room, will you pray with me as we pray for those who raise their hands? God, life is stressful. Everybody can admit. And that stress is not an indicator that we're weak. It's an indicator that we're doing something brave. But God, when the stress comes over the choice that we've made, we start to feel weak. And doubt the happiness that can come with the choice that we made. Maybe a move across the country. Maybe a move across the street. Maybe a move into a new school. We're doubting it. God, let us own it. Let us own. Let us own the outcome. Because you say no matter what happens in our life, you are the one who brings good things out of bad things. It doesn't matter what happens in our pain, in our hurt, in our destruction. So be with those who raise their hands and let them own what they know they need to own, no matter the outcome. Help them find joy and peace and happiness and strength and courage. Let them be those who walk through this life letting others know how happy it is to be one who follows you because we can't predict and control the outcomes, but we know that you will always bring joy in our spirit. So God, help those who raise their hand. And God, for everybody else in the room who's here, maybe some of us, we don't know you yet. Let us pray this prayer for those of us who want to know you. God, we have all fallen short of the expectation of how you created us. And we've made some sinful choices. But God, we know your grace covers us and forgives us. So God, forgive me of all the ways that I've fallen short and lead me in a direction that is full of redemption. In your name we pray, amen.